especially in patients uh, on opioid use disorders, uh, patients with opioid use disorders who might be on medications for opioid use disorders. So that's really what I want to do. And I've included a number of slides for reference that some of you guys can take away, hopefully, and, um, and use them. So another reason I'll make sure that everyone gets these slides. So we'll start, as always, with the prevalence. Um, how common is pain in patients with opioid use disorders? So turns out quite common. So if we look at, for example, um, patients, you know, what percentage of patients who have opioid use disorders also meet criteria for chronic pain, the number is very high. Um, you can see here that, especially in some of the newer studies, the, you know, over half of two, almost two thirds of patients with opioid use disorder have met criteria for chronic pain. So quite prevalent, right? Um, and um, and this one, this slide is really digging into this uh, uh, this uh, study by Eling Ser from uh, 2017, where they basically followed uh, within their clinic all patients coming in uh, for opioid use disorders, seeking treatment for opioid use disorders, and assess them for pain, um, and found out again about two thirds in this group met criteria for chronic pain. These are all patients with opioid use disorders, and about a third did not. Out of the ones that did, you can see that by far the most common scenario was the development of pain first. So it appeared that the pain in about 40% of patients out of these 5,000, uh, pain came first. <clears throat> and then at some point, our patients developed an opioid use disorder. In about 15%, they had both opioid use disorder and pain when they sought treatment, and the team couldn't quite figure out what came first. And it was only about 10% in whom the opioid use disorder came first and then pain developed. So I think this kind of, to me at least, should make us think and reflect upon prescribing practices, perhaps, uh, and you know, kind of going way upstream in terms of how we treat chronic pain and responsible manner of prescribing opioids in patients with chronic pain, and whether that can sort of uh, prevent some of this transition uh, and development of opioid use disorder. The study didn't go into that, but I bring that up because at least for me, that became one of the reflection points when I read the study. Um, and patients who had this 10% who had opioid use disorder first tended to just have more severe opioid use disorder more uh, substance use disorder related morbidities. Um, so with that, without further ado, I'm gonna go right into acute pain management, right? Um, in terms of uh, patients with opioid use disorder. So uh, again, public domain art by someone who identified themselves um, and uh, you know about uh, their experience of uh, pain. Start with the vignette. Um, all identifying details change. AN, also fictitious initials. 45-year-old female status post shoulder surgery, has a history of an opioid use disorder, was previously treated with methadone twice for that opioid use disorder. Both times did well while on methadone, but then stopped the methadone and returned to using illicit opioids. And right before the shoulder surgery, had been using half a gram of heroin smoked two or three times a day. And post-surgery now, she's on morphine, continuous infusion, uh, 4.2 milligrams an hour, plus a 10 milligrams IV every four hours as needed for breakthrough pain. She last requested it and used it two hours ago. So technically, there is two more hours to go before she can request that additional 10 milligrams morphine, right? But she's requesting more pain medication, reports her pain is 9 out of 10. She's in tears. She's crying. Her vital signs are stable. And when you get to the unit, you're told, quote, she is drug seeking. She's already getting more pain meds than any other patient on the unit. She doesn't need more. Besides, she's an addict and we don't want to worsen her addiction. So let's keep this patient in mind as we go through the next few slides. Some commonly held beliefs that may be reflected in this quotation that we were presented with. Acute pain in general uh, is reported to be frequently undertreated in inpatient setting, up to 60%. And it's been reported, although there is no great data on it that I can find, that this may be even more so in patients with addictions or substance use disorders. We do know that um, you know, there are often stigmas that healthcare professionals have regarding patients with substance use disorders, right? Uh, where substance use disorder is often seen as, uh, patients are seen as manipulative or even violent. Um, and, you know, um, and these attitudes really play into how uh, the treatment they receive. So some basic suggested approach. 
I think it's a good idea. And again, we're talking about acute pain settings that we begin with patient self-reported pain. Knowing that pain behaviors vary widely, uh, we start accepting patients about what they're telling us, right, in terms of what their pain is like. And then we think about it. What might be causing this experience? Certainly, it could be the phenomenon of addiction, right, substance use disorder. It could also be something called pseudo-addiction, which is a term that's been around for about four decades, originally uh, came out of the inpatient cancer palliative care literature, which is the idea that patients may be displaying certain behaviors because their pain is undertreated. And when you get their pain appropriately treated, some of those concerning behaviors might dissipate, right? And their functioning might improve. And that's the big difference between addiction and pseudo addiction. But in the case of a true substance use disorder, simply raising the dose of the medication is unlikely to improve the functioning. The functioning may continue to worsen versus physiologic dependence, right? Uh, that the patient's body is used to a medication and that's why they're sort of crying <clears throat> for it, requesting it. And if required, in general, the recommended approach is that when we're talking about acute pain, we do not withhold opioid analgesics from people with substance use disorders, right? In acute care settings, in inpatient acute care settings, it doesn't seem to worsen the outcomes. Uh, and there's some literature on it. Also keep in mind that because our patients have tolerance, they may actually require higher doses of opioids because of that baseline tolerance. Uh, and this last bullet I included, because I get these calls sometimes, where one of my patients might be inpatient uh, with a acute pain generator, and we'll get a call saying, well, the patient's already on methadone, 80 milligrams. Why should they need additional pain analgesia? So that's why I included this sentence that, remember, that opioid agonist treatment is going to be treating their baseline addiction. Their baseline substance use disorder is unlikely to provide uh, treatment of the acute pain on top of it. These next three slides are courtesy of, and uh, thank you to them for allowing me to use it, uh, PCSS um, in the emergency department uh, course that uh, I don't know if Dr. Warwick is here uh, today, but he does quite a bit of this training for ED docs as does Dr. Eric Ketchum from Prez. And this is, and I've included these largely as reference slides. Now I know we have at least one provider working in an ED setting um, that they identified today. So hopefully this can be helpful. So next three slides are all courtesy of that, where if a patient is in an emergency department, they have opioid use disorder, they're on one of the medications, this is kind of the general algorithm of how you might manage the acute pain. Not gonna go into too much detail here, but it is there as a reference. Some key points to think about are our alternatives to opioid medications. We should always be thinking about that, including comfort measures, things like, right, um, you know, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Uh, also things like um, gabapentinoids are alpha-2 agonists, and also things like local anesthetics, uh, ketamine in sub-dissociative uh, doses, et cetera. Um, if opioids are needed, in general, initially we wind up optimizing the dose of their medication, right? Um, and uh, what does that mean? So this is really what it means. This slide is going into it. That buprenorphine, um, well, um, you know, um, so I'm going to go right into this. So what if they're on methadone and now there is acute pain management need, whether in the ED or outside the emergency department? Um, this is really what we recommend. That first, every patient who's on methadone maintenance should have a home clinic, their opioid treatment program where they go for their methadone. And our patients, because they want to ensure that their pain is treated, are generally likely to tell us what their home clinic is. So I think it's a good idea to get the consent, right? Or if it's a truly emergent setting, you don't need the consent, but calling the opioid treatment program and verifying their dose, right? Um, and if the dose can be verified, great. But if it cannot be verified, we generally recommend breaking up the self-reported dose into three or four times a day dosing rather than giving it all at once. It's safer and it's gonna better help the pain. And on top of it, you can with methadone add in other short acting opioids, but you have to be very careful to ensure, you know, to protect against kind of cumulative respiratory suppression. Another technically a strategy would be to gradually increase the methadone dose. I'm not a huge fan of this because if you do that prior to discharge, you're gonna have to work the patient towards their previous methadone dose 
before referring the patient back to their opioid treatment program. So in some ways, it's a more practical strategy if the methadone itself doesn't cut it. Uh, and if those non-opioid medications don't provide appropriate analgesia to add in short acting opioids for breakthrough pain, but you have to be careful with it. Don't administer buprenorphine because that will precipitate withdrawals. If the patients can't take their oral methadone because of medical condition, IV methadone is an option, but dosing is very different. So consult an addiction medicine specialist before doing that, but I've included sort of just general guideline here, right? So that's a little bit. What about buprenorphine and acute pain management? Some basic principles of that um, is again, always, right? Going back to this PCSS um, algorithm, you want to try all of the non-opioid strategies first. In an outpatient setting, of course, the big ones are gonna be acetaminophen and or NSAIDs as long as there are no medical contraindications. Of course, inpatient, we have a lot more options. Once that's been tried, the first thing we're gonna do is adjust the dosing of the buprenorphine itself to optimize its analgesic potential. So the first thing you're gonna do is split the dose up. So if you have a patient, for example, who's taking 12 milligrams a day of buprenorphine, temporarily, you may wanna think about splitting it to four milligrams three times a day, right? For example, because remember, buprenorphine when used for analgesia requires more frequent dosing. Temporarily, you can also increase the dose of buprenorphine. Is This itself is not enough to provide appropriate analgesia, right? So for example, um, you know, you can go, if someone was taking 12 milligrams a day, now they've got an acute pain generator, acetaminophen doesn't provide enough um, pain control, maybe temporarily you go from 12 milligrams daily to four milligrams four times a day. So not only have I split the dose, I've also gone up on it temporarily. And you have that discussion with the patient ahead of time that this is really for this acute analgesia and we will eventually go back to the dose you were on. Uh, in inpatient settings, you can always think about IV buprenorphine, right? And again, in inpatient or emergency settings, you can also augment with short acting opioids that have a high mu opioid receptor binding affinity. And certainly our anesthesiologists are quite skilled at doing this uh, and consult an addiction medicine expert, of course. What about perioperatively? If you have a patient on buprenorphine who's gonna require a surgery, again, remember that if you're the outpatient provider, you're going to be the bridge between the patient and those surgeons to make sure that the patient's pain is going to be safely treated, appropriately treated, and they're not going to be in pain and they're gonna be safe. So first thing we do is that as soon as the patient knows they're gonna have a procedure, we get consents and initiate the conversation. Historically, what used to happen is we would stop the buprenorphine one to three days before the procedure. Uh, I recently actually even had a patient who said their surgeon told them that they should stop the buprenorphine two weeks before the surgery. Right, and the patient was understandably very scared of it. But that's what used to happen. You stop the buprenorphine to open up all the mu opioid receptors, then perioperative pain is treated with full doses of mu opioid agonists. And once that need is no longer there, you gradually transition them back into buprenorphine. But over the last four years, we've really shifted from the strategy, right? Um, and as this editorial says, Patients maintained on buprenorphine for opioid use disorder should continue buprenorphine through the perioperative period in most cases, right? Uh, so in general, it should not be discontinued. You may want to bring the dose of buprenorphine down, certainly under 16 milligrams a day, a couple of days before the surgery to open up uh, some additional mu opioid receptors, right? So buprenorphine is on board first, it's maintained, right? And then your perioperatively, all those strategies I discussed, including, for example, run doing a, a epidural and running a local anesthetic through it, using our alpha-2 agonists, such as dexmedetomidine, uh, you know, potentially ketamine, um, are all utilized to optimize the pain management. And if opioids are needed, generally, uh, IV fentanyl or dilaudid are the two common opioids used. Post-operatively, right, buprenorphine is optimize, so maxing the dose, splitting up, up into multiple times a day dosing, and once that pain, post-operative pain resolves, going back to their pre-operative dose of buprenorphine. That's the strategy that's often used, but this takes a lot of coordination, right? And that's why if at all possible, what you're gonna do is get the consent, talk to the surgeons to come up with a plan. 
What if the patient is on naltrexone? This is tricky. This is a busy slide, right? But these are the basic principles. If you have a patient on injectable naltrexone especially, I ask them to carry a medical alert card that says that they're on naltrexone and so normal analgesia may not be very successful because remember naltrexone is blocking those mu opioid receptors um, you know, very strongly. If it's an elective procedure, what we recommend is that the last dose of oral naltrexone should be at least three days before the surgery. And the last injection of naltrexone should be at least four weeks before the surgery. And if it's an acute you know, management need, kind of an emergent surgery, then multimodal analgesia is the name of the game. And I've included again, some reference slides. This is just an algorithm, right? That talks about how we manage acute pain as we've talked about with buprenorphine, methadone and naltrexone along with some of the commonly used non-opioid analgesics, especially in inpatient setting. And you can see even without going into detail that there are many of them that can be utilized. Uh, and oftentimes with naltrexone uh, in an emergent surgery case, uh, many of these wind up, wind up being used, right? So with that, that brings us a little bit to the chronic pain management piece. And I'm just gonna sort of go into this a uh, little bit, uh, another piece of art by someone uh, struggling with chronic pain um, and uh, kind of a poignant, poignant art piece, I think. So basic considerations. So here with chronic pain, our approach is very different because a history of opioid use disorders is actually the single biggest predictor of aberrant behavior to prescribed opioids. So we have to be very careful. So in general, we want to consult a pain management specialist or an addiction specialist, if at all possible. We certainly wanna use a multidisciplinary team approach when we treat these patients. We wanna optimize all of our non-opioid and adjuvant medications, right? Such as our NSAIDs, such as our SNRIs or TCAs, and also optimize, if at all possible, all the evidence-based and evidence-guided non-pharmacological therapies, such as cognitive behavioral therapy for pain, or acceptance and commitment therapy, or traditional healing modalities, certainly physical therapy, acupuncture, et cetera. So we really wanna optimize this. And if opioids are prescribed, we have to be extremely careful. Generally, CDC recommends using validated screening tools before prescribing any opioids and monitoring our patients very closely through urine drug screens, through PDMP monitoring, through treatment agreements, um, and frequent follow-ups. And certainly we wanna ensure that we're prescribing naloxone. So these are just some basic principles. Uh, for many patients who have opioid use disorder and chronic pain, buprenorphine really winds up being a medication of choice that can target both for many patients. And this is a vignette that I used to demonstrate that uh, based on a patient here at our clinic. A 55 year old female came in for treatment for her addiction, she said. 12 year history of chronic pain following an ATV accident and pelvic fracture and increased the doses of opioids gradually all the way up to 300 morphine milligram equivalents a day. But that wasn't enough. She kept running out early, buying them off the street, going to multiple doctors. And as we talked to her, she started saying that these aren't really helping me. I'm now having problems in functioning with at home, at work, in my relationships. My depression and anxiety are getting worse and my pain is now worse than ever. So as we talked to her, it really became clear that while this started with chronic pain, right? At this point, when we saw her, in addition to chronic pain, she had developed opioid use disorder and she had developed opioid-induced hyperalgesia from this chronic opioid use. So we talked about her treatment options and started her eventually on buprenorphine. And she actually wound up stabilizing on a fairly low dose of four milligrams three times a day and did really well on it. At this point, she's even switched back to her primary care provider, is no longer a patient at our clinic. But she reported significant improvements in pain, was happier, and she felt, quote unquote, I have my life back, right? So that's the point I wanna highlight, that a subset of patients who have both chronic pain and opioid use disorder, or opioid misuse or opioid abuse even, may be helped tremendously with just buprenorphine naloxone use to target both. But remember that we want to be doing divided, you know, multiple times a day dosing to really optimize the analgesic potential, right? Some reference slides as to why buprenorphine may be a good medication. This is an older study that I like to highlight. It's about seven years old at this point, um, where they took patients on very high doses of opioids for chronic pain. 
So all these patients were on at least 200 morphine milligram equivalents, and many of them were on over a thousand morphine milligram equivalents a day. And they converted them to buprenorphine and asked them how bad their pain was. And in all the cases, once they were switched over to buprenorphine, you can see significant reductions in their pain experience. Um, it's a scale of one to 10. Uh, 10 is the worst pain, zero is no pain. So the lower the better, right? So when they were switched over to buprenorphine, uh, statistically as a, as a group, all of these patients pain improved and certainly was a lot safer. So important to keep in mind. That brings me to methadone. So while buprenorphine is the primary medicine we use for patients with opioid use disorders and chronic pain, there is a subset of patients for whom buprenorphine is just not gonna be enough. And we have to think about methadone. In my experience, this is generally the group with cancer-related pain, right? Uh, and this is a vignette again of a patient at ASAP, 64-year-old patient came into the emergency department with dysuria and was diagnosed with advanced cervical carcinoma. And we talked to the team. They were very scared to discharge her uh, with like a <coughs> port uh, because of her long history of heroin addiction. And they were worried about ongoing treatment. She was not in any treatment. They also thought she was going to need so much pain management that buprenorphine just would not be enough. So basically, we coordinated. Where at our clinic, we started her on methadone for opioid use disorder and titrated it very carefully while her um, oncologist, her palliative care team, placed her on short-acting opioids for breakthrough pain. And we talked very, you know, very frequently and collaborated, and the patient actually did very well uh, for the remainder of her life. She actually never returned to illicit opioids. So in some cases, in some rare cases, the patient's opioid dependence, the opioid use disorder, may be better treated with methadone because the pain is just so severe. But again, buprenorphine winds up being my go-to. And finally, if someone has significant chronic pain, naltrexone is just not a good treatment option because if someone's on naltrexone, uh, opioids are basically out of the equation um, and you're, that's not gonna get them any additional analgesia. So we generally avoid naltrexone in patients who have very severe chronic pain. I will end here. I think I am right at 12.30, that was my goal. So I will stop here again, these slides are, I've included a bunch of reference slides that we will mail out to everyone. Thank you.